Hi, welcome to this presentation. You've chosen by coming here to learn more about phoneme and phonological awareness. Why are they so important? What's the difference between them? And what is a developmental sequence that you can expect to see? Um, I'm going to consider some things about assessing phonological awareness too that most people might not consider. Some things I've just learned in the recent years. Okay, but before we begin, I always like to recommend really valuable sources for you to go to for more information. So this one's all about phonological awareness. If at the end of it you're wondering um, if there's a program out there that's really good, evidence-based, highly effective, um, if that's the case, you would do well to consider Road to the Code, pictured there too. Um, it's got 44 lessons. The lessons are 15 minutes each. You do them four days a week. So in short, the 44 lessons that are 15 minutes long can be done in 11 weeks. It's a total of 11 hours. It's not about speed, though, of implementation, of course. The beauty of it <clears throat> is that it's been used in at least seven research studies even highlighted in the National Reading Panel Report, uh, the National Early Literacy Panel Report. It's just got significant performance and credentials and so I really highly recommend that one. <clears throat> the lessons are really, really detailed. Uh, all the necessary materials that you need are in the back. You just make copies and get organized and you're ready to go. And it's really reasonable cost-wise too. <clears throat> and the other text, it's one I recommend a lot. Um, Assessing, Overcoming, essential, um, and Reading Difficulties, you see the title. 2015, I can't attend a conference or go and participate on a listserv talk without someone talking about this book. Seasoned reading professionals are really like, ah, <laughs> loving the clear understandings they're getting from the explanations of phonological awareness, its importance, um, a really easy to understand grip on the research. It's a must read for reading teachers, reading specialists, reading professors, reading researchers, for everybody involved in reading. It's just going around like crazy. Everyone loves it. Okay, perhaps um, you've seen series, in this video, in these series you've seen a video with a simple view of reading, okay? And there's even one dedicated just to the simple view. But what is it? I just want to touch base here. It's a research validated framework about how do we get to reading comprehension. Two researchers, Goff and Tunmer, first put this forth as a formula, believe it or not. So if you can't decode, and by that they mean read words outside of context, if you can't get the words off of the page, there's not going to be reading comprehension. Similar, um, comprehension of language. If that's something you can't do, if language comprehension, and by that I mean Talk, um, deriving meaning from spoken words like they are in sentences and discourse, receptive vocabulary, <clears throat> grammar. Um, so if that kind of comprehension of language is lacking, there's not going to be reading comprehension. Some people get a little confused when they see language comprehension and reading comprehension, like what? By reading comprehension they mean print. And by language comprehension, that's not what they mean. So the simple view is called the simple view, simple, because it makes it simple to see that there really are two main components needed to comprehend, te comprehend text for reading comprehension. We need both of those keys to turn. And it lays out for us what's needed to teach those components. So in the case of word recognition, students need to be able to decode the words. We're working backwards here, see? And then in order to decode those words, they need to be proficient with phoneme awareness, and they need to be proficient with letter sounds. Okay, that being said, we're ready to go um, a little bit. So it's really important for educators to understand the difference between phonological awareness and phoneme awareness. I want to spend a little smidgen of time here, because if you have the knowledge of that difference, um, it'll lead to better instructional decision making. When I first learned about it, I was told, don't worry about the difference. But phonological awareness is a broad skill that includes being aware of the sounds in our oral language. Oral language is our spoken language, not what's written down. Print and letters have nothing to do with phonological awareness. There's no pencils running around. So phonological awareness is just being aware of elements of our spoken language. And this starts with being able to identify and be aware of individual words in our flow of speech, okay, word awareness. 
Um, this is something that we have as adults, but children become aware that, oh, when mom's talking, she's saying individual words, and, um, and they can hear these as we talk to them and read to them. So we could say, hold up a finger for every word I say. I want my pepperoni on my pizza. You know, seven words, yay. It's about this time that a sensitivity to rhyme would begin. Pepperoni, jepperoni, pepperoni, like that kind of thing. They get those things rhyme. And then a more sophisticated awareness for kids would be awareness of the syllables in our words. And here pre preschool kids can start to a uh, clapping game, you know, clapping up pepperoni and larger chunks. Okay, so that's not a whole word anymore, but phonological awareness is still syllable awareness. That's another kind. And we can ask them, say mailbox. Now say mailbox, but this time don't say box. Okay, that's something that would be syllable awareness. Um, another part would be to have them manipulate parts of syllables. At first it would be um, separating onsets from rhymes, the blue box here. Um, onsets are the beginning consonant sounds in a word, and rhymes are the remaining part. So they would be able to provide us the right answer if we would say something like, okay, say box. Now this time, don't say b, and they would respond with ox. All right, so then there's another kind of phonological awareness, and this is phoneme awareness. So phoneme awareness is a kind of phonological awareness. By the way, the Greek word phone, P-H-O-N, means sound. We use phones to talk to each other. Sound is not print, remember? So this is a second reminder that this has, none of this has anything to do with writing or print, okay? Um, it's the sounds, not print. Okay, so a phoneme is the smallest piece in our spoken words. Cat, one syllable, but it can be broken down into three little bits. K, at, and those are the phonemes. All right, little sounds, phonemes, very difficult for little people to notice. All right, why? Because they're used to hearing words all together. We never talk in phonemes. We talk in whole words. That's what our speech is. We talk in words. Um, we don't talk in syllables. Your bedroom better be clean today. And <laughs> um, even though onsets and rhymes come up in books and songs and stuff, Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers and so forth, the awareness of these larger pieces of speech, like syllables and nonsense rhymes, are easier to come by because they experience them a lot when they're little. Uh, but phonemes, we don't ever say p, e, p, er, o, n, e. We don't, kids aren't ex, you know, experiencing that when they're little. So to, we need to tear our words down into the smallest sounds to kids. Words are just whole chunks. It's difficult them, for them to understand that it can even be done. So we might say, how many sounds in sun? And they'll often say one, because they heard us say one thing, sun. Um, it's just one thing that comes out of our mouths all together. All the phonemes are mushed when we talk. Um, as we say sun, we don't pause, we don't say this. Um, but, so the, as we, but as we do talk, we say sun, the S blends into the uh, and it's all shingled, dovetailed, and melted together but our alphabet requires us to pull it to apart. It's really hard. Okay. So becoming aware of these things, these phonemes, being able to manipulate them, important. <clears throat> and when I say manipulate, I mean add one to a word, remove one from a word, switch them, substitute, um, change cat to cab. You know, students need to be able to do this really proficiently, automatically, easily to become good readers. And this means to a subconscious level, okay, efficient, so that the brain just takes over. Um, in the meantime, though, for, for now, let's just leave it alone that it's a student's level of phoneme, or phoneme awareness, a student's level of it, is the number one most potent predictor of future reading achievement. This should be ingrained in you. It plays a non-negotiable role in beginning of reading and it is the base of all other critical reading components that it builds from. Non-negotiable, decades of empirical research evidence starting in the 70s show this to be the case each and every time. It's the starting point for reading. Our spoken words are represented with squiggles, 
letters. We have to read it. So our print is an alphabet, and the, the alphabet is, our, is, is pictures of our phonemes. So hand in hand, phonemes print, they map to each other. They, it, the, the alphabet was designed for our phonemes. So if children fail to develop a proficient awareness of this, um, their ability to work with the alphabet is compromised. Again, decades of research have followed students who have difficulty with phoneme awareness, and it reveals the same outcome, difficulty reading. Uh, and we see this in readers of all ages across the lifespan. Other things can cause reading difficulty, let's be sure about that, reading comprehension difficulty, but suffice it to say that if a student has difficulty reading words, difficulty with phoneme awareness is very likely present and it's very likely a contributing factor. Um, the road to reading will be um, an incline, so to speak. All right, so SEDL, this website here, it's a nonprofit education research organization that disseminates research. It was founded in the 60s, and it was founded to improve teaching and learning by connecting research to practice. In 2007, it became an affiliate of the American Institutes for Research, and you can still find their resources, though, on their original website. They've stopped updating it for many years, but it makes light work for me to show others just a tiny sampling of the mounds of research on phoneme awareness. I mean, you could fill a room with it if you printed it all, all out. This is not an updated list, but it makes clear a point we've known for a long, long, long time that a strong positive relationship exists between phonological awareness and reading skills. The sources at the bottom are some that I um, added to indicate the research goes back even farther into the 70s. And I wanted to include Blackman and Tangle's 1988 study, which featured the Road to the Code program at the beginning, that I talked about at the beginning of this presentation. So the findings from their study showed a substantial impact of being trained in phonological awareness um, on the kindergarten students' abilities to name letters, letter sounds, read, and spell simple words. After just 44 15-minute lessons here that the kids got they, uh, of the training they received, they significantly outperformed a matched group of children in everything. And so this body, not everything but reading, <laughs> so this is huge, the body of research, and it points to something. Kids who are better at phonological awareness tasks make it more likely that they'll begin, become a strong reader. <clears throat> okay, similarly, next slide, it makes a clear point that we have known for a long, long, long time, many decades, that phoneme awareness is one of the best predictors of reading success. The research even shows that the better a student is at phonological awareness tasks, the more likely it is that they're going to be a strong reader. It's got predictive value, um, and that predictive value can't be understated or, or disputed at this point. It's just, <laughs> it's a huge body of science, a boulder. Finally, for a great many years, the research has made it clear that children who fail to develop phoneme awareness have difficulty learning basic reading and spelling skills. Um, it's proven, the research, we have a lot of it that has converged and none that has proved otherwise, that if students do poorly on phoneme awareness tasks, it's going to be likely that he or she is going to have difficulty learning to read and spell. You, okay, that's what it's about. The research since 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, all the way up to today is in unison. And this text that I suggested earlier, Kilpatrick states that while he was writing it, a search in a database for phonological and phoneme awareness yielded 3,600 plus results. Um, and so why did this have such a long time to impact educational practice? Why are we only recently understanding it and including it in published programs is, is amazing. So we've known it for decades and only now getting it. So here's an example of a study done in 95. O'Connor, Jenkins, and Slocum assigned non-reading kindergarten children whose scores were less than 30% on phonological tasks of blending and segmenting, very simple words. 66 of these kids were randomly assigned to one of three intervention groups to figure out what kind of phonological instruction is needed to bring skill levels up to the level demonstra demonstrated excuse me, by the kids whose phonological awareness scores were above 50% and who were already, according to their teachers, starting to read. So the three red are the um, 
phonemic learning groups. Um, and the, so we have the blend segment group, and they were trained using activities with, that would have them blend and segment sounds and spoken words. The global phonological awareness group practiced phoneme awareness with a wider range of activities, blending, segmenting, rhyming, word-to-word -word matching. And both of these um, children also um, learned letter sound instruction too, so they were taught some of the letter sounds. The letter sound group, the, the third red group here, practiced activities to learn the same, okay, there were eight letters, the same eight letters that were taught to the first two red groups there. All right, so if you look at the results below, you can see that phonological awareness groups, both of them, not only made strong gains on phonological awareness, makes sense because that's what they were being taught, <laughs> um, <coughs> but they also made strong gains in using that and their knowledge of letter sounds to read words. <clears throat> the group just getting letter sound instruction made minimal or no gains in learning to read words. <clears throat> their literacy development was hampered. Um, by their continued low scores on phonological awareness. So what these researchers found <clears throat> is what we see in classrooms across the country. So let's have you try counting phonemes. If you need some knowledge about this, here's your chance. So, and it's good always to practice even if you have the knowledge. So since these activities should really involve spoken words, I'll try to say the words and you tap a finger for each sound that you hear. All right, I'm going to demonstrate one. <clears throat> show, sh, oh, two phonemes, two speech sounds. This is a phoneme awareness task because we are separating the spoken words into their individual phonemes. I can't be explicit enough. Okay, here's another face. F, a, s, three sounds. Did you let the spelling of face that you hold in your long term memory mess you up? Hopefully not. Remember, just the sounds, not the spellings. What does your mouth have to do to make these sounds? Okay. Next one, flick. Flick. Okay. How about <clears throat> preach? P, er, e, ch. Four sounds. Six letters, but we don't care. Those six letters make four sounds. All right. We shouldn't care a bit how it's spelled. All right, let me demonstrate that with the next one. Hard one now, ready? Fix. This is a tricky one for a lot of people. Fix. Four phonemes, because in English, the letter X represents two spoken sounds. K, s, k, s. Um, you'll see kids spelling fix, F-I-K-S, for that reason. All right, sleigh. Many kids who believe in Santa want to see a sleigh. That's the next one, sleigh. <clears throat> Wish I could see how many fingers you were holding up. Is it three? If not, tap again. S L A E I G H. You may have seen it in your adult reader mind and it might have messed you up. Okay, so it doesn't matter how many letters are there and you have to ignore that completely. Children don't have that noise. We have that adult spelling noise in our heads and little kids don't. So you, it's hard for us to ignore the spelling and concentrate on the sounds that your mouth has to make. <clears throat> to make the word out loud. All right, easier one. Soon. S -u -n. My mouth had to do three things. S -u -n. Three sounds. All right, how about sure? This one's very tough. People get really hesitant because, you know, hmm. Make sure you pay attention to what you have to do to say that. Sh er. Just two sounds, okay? You're orthographic processor, the spellings are in your head. Okay, how about one more? Song. This one's very tricky. It's three sounds. S -aw -n. If you are a linguist or a speech pathologist, this would be easy for you, but you should know it because you're going to see it cause a lot of confusion <laughs> amongst your kids when they go to spell words. The term for this phoneme, the last one, the ng, is a velar nasal. Um, here you can see it, what it looks like, how it's spelled, the, the figure for it, the symbol for a velar nasal in the upper right hand corner. When we make it, our tongue curls up against the back of our mouth and air comes out the nose. Um, the vocal cords vibrate as we say it. Mm. Mm. So it's a voiced phoneme. No air comes out of the mouth. 
So to demonstrate this, where it really is happening, say the word sun, phoneme by phoneme, and freeze like a statue as you're making that final n sound. Freeze and notice where your tongue position is when you make that n sound. The tip of your tongue mm, is touching behind your top teeth. So when we say words like song, our tongue isn't getting in a position like that n sound is. It's making mm, mm, mm. very different. Well, not very different, very similar actually. All right, so I'm going to break my own rule and now show you some words in print. We wouldn't do this with students because remember, phonological and phoneme awareness tasks uh, shouldn't be printed, presented with print, but adults, so let's try it. For each of these, um, say them to yourself and think of the last sound it makes. And you can pause here and hit stop so you can do it. <clears throat> okay, here are the answers. So anytime you see slanted lines around a letter here, it means we're just looking at the sound. We're talking about the sound. So for bathe, v is the sound. And we can touch our voice box and feel it moving. V, it's a voiced one. Other times we can say the TH and not use our voice. The word math, our tongue is still here but the voice box isn't, box isn't moving or involved. So the letters TH can make two sounds, one voice and one unvoiced. For dogs, S is making the Z sound, which it often does, especially at the end of words and with plurals. As a matter of fact, in the sentence I just said, it happened three times, does, words, plurals. The word lamb ends in M, but the B is silent. And the word hung, we see that velar nasal again. Mm. And there's its weird symbol. And then words ending in X, er, X you're going to hear S sound at the end. Wedge ends in J and walked ends in T. That ED ending can be tricky. It can make three sounds. It can be wanted, ed, strolled, d, and clicked, t. Okay. Now that you've had a go at it, we should consider a learning task that we often see in schools. We give kids pictures, great, and we ask them how they're alike or how they're different. It's an odd man out task, kind of. It's a perfect way um, for young children who are becoming aware of these parts of our spoken words. Uh, they can't read yet. They don't know how to read words yet, and we don't care about how letters look right now anyway. That's not the point. So looking at the top row of pictures, you see a cat, hat, and pot and then a pen, hen, and pig. So if we were having children select which two go together and which doesn't belong, would this be a phoneme awareness task or a phonological awareness task? Hat, cat, pot, pen, hen, pig. All right, if you're thinking phonological awareness, you're right. Uh, this is a rhyming task, and when words rhyme, we aren't listening for individual phonemes, right? We're listening to the entire ending chunk of a word, not the individual pieces. So any, anytime it's a bigger chunk of a word than a phoneme, we're basically calling it a phonological awareness task. All right, middle row has hat, heart, ball, cat, cup, fish. We would be asking kids again to tell us which two have something in common, the beginning sound here. So now you're probably thinking phoneme awareness because the children have to identify that single phoneme sound at the beginning of the word, and that would be right. Uh, last row, nose, dog, bag, pot, clock, bike. What do you think we'd be asking kids to compare here? If you said phoneme awareness again, that we'd be asking kids to identify that single, listen to that single sound, that single phoneme at the end of the word, you'd be right again. So dog and bag both end in g, and the clock and bike both end in k, even though they're spelled differently. It doesn't matter. All right, so this graphic from the readingrockets.org's fabulous website is a nice depiction of phone, how phonological awareness develops. As you can see, largest parts of spoken words down to the smallest phoneme, which makes sense. You have to crawl before you walk, and you have to walk before you run. It's the same thing here. So awareness in words and sentences, like we talked about a few slides ago. Then a sensitivity to rhyme. We go down to syllable awareness, where they become able to clap those syllables or blend them together to make a word. 
then onset and rhyme, separating that first one from the rest. And I like what they point out here on the, um, on the right for this, that it's really much easier um, to recognize a rhyme when someone else says it than it is to produce it yourself for kids. It's cute. And finally, phoneme awareness. You can see all of the various abilities that are entailed. Wow. Look at how many are there under that box. Uh, everything we just saw with the pictures of the cat and the cup and final sounds for clock and bike, blending sounds into words, and then segmenting spoken words into individual uh, phonemes. And then finally, manipulating phonemes is the toughest. Think about the example they have here. Say smoke without the mm. To do this, a child has to segment the phonemes. S, m, o, k. Then identify where the mm is. Oh, identification. Got it. And then remove it. And then remember which ones are left. <laughs> and then blend them together. Essentially, it's a four for one. Segment, identify, manipulate, blend. Pretty abstract stuff. No wonder it's hard for these kids sometimes. So, especially if you have phonological processing issues. So when should kids be expected to do these things? What do the Common Core Learning Standards require? The information in this table is taken from page 22 of the New York State P through 12 Common Core Learning Standards for ELA, uh, the foundational skills piece. And as we can see, looking at the kindergarten expectations here, students should be able to rhyme, count, pronounce, blend, and segment um, onsets and rhymes, uh, isolate and pronounce phonemes and simple words at the initial, medial, and final positions, and finally, add or substitute phonemes and simple words. I bolded the phonological segment in here so we can see that similar to the hierarchy on the last slide from readingrockets.org, the task requirements get more fine-grained. But think about it, by the end of kindergarten, we have to get them all the way from rhyming or adding and substituting phonemes. So this would be like saying or asking them, say fun, now say fun, but this time say a ah, instead of a. Uh. That's right, fan. Pretty sophisticated progression, really. And so now let's look at grade one. They have to demonstrate that they can tell the difference between long and short vowel sounds. Okay. They have to blend together phonemes into small words. Okay, even those with blends. So we'd give them g, a, uh, m, mm, and they'd have to say gum, or we'd give them g, i, f, t, and they'd have to tell us it's gift. Item C is similar to the kindergarten task on the left. And then finally, they have to segment words into phonemes. I'm a little perplexed, I gotta talk to someone about it, as to why the standards expect kindergartners to be able to add and substitute, which requires segment, identify, substitute, blend, and why the first graders' goals require blending, item B, and segmenting, item D. Peculiar, but until I get a good answer, which I haven't yet, I'm just going to be happy these standards exist since we know phonological awareness to the level of phoneme awareness is critical. So I'm just going to be happy. But there's another thing to mention. If you're expecting me to advance to the next slide and then see what second and third and fourth and fifth graders are expected to do with phonological awareness, it's not going to happen. There are no more in the foundational standards. It appears to be assumed, this is another question I have, that children will have mastered phonological awareness once they can blend and segment in first grade. And once they can do even more than that in kindergarten. Hmm. Okay, weird. We're talking about it with people. <laughs> All right, so here's yet <clears throat> another tr uh, chart from readingrockets.org. Fantastic. I highly recommend going to this website, finding it, printing it out a copy, bring out, printing out a copy if you can and making sure to read the example tasks a teacher would give to students. So I'll even pause, or you should pause here, I'm not going to pause, but this is a depiction of the sequence of phonological skills, how they typically progress for 80 to 90 percent of typical students. See that line, the red line at the top with a red arrow? This is how phonological awareness develops for typical students, 80 to 90 percent of them. The left column shows us the typical age at which these skills usually develop. Hmm, look at the age. Let your eyes fall to the bottom here. Oh, hooray. 
Yay! They're pointing out that phonological awareness keeps developing. So we know that when students are seven years old, eight, nine, when they're in grades two, three, four, their ability to manipulate phonemes is still developing. So what's evident in the research literature wasn't really, it doesn't seem to match up with the Common Core state standards. I wonder if that'll change with different changes that they do to them. Okay. So why is phonological awareness such an important predictor of reading development? This is a super simplified graphic based on Kilpatrick um, showing how early, basic, and advanced levels um, of phoneme awareness are related oops, I go this way, um, to word reading development. The first aspect, aspect of word reading development is learning letter names and sounds. So how does early phonological awareness help to develop letter knowledge? Well, a letter is laden with the identity of a sound. When you think about it, a letter is a sound. So just the letter names even themselves contain the sound that the letter name is. For example, the letter name M, like all consonants, has two sounds. E, M. The last sound, M, is right there in the letter's name. It's its sound. Similarly, the letter name P has two sounds, P, E, and the first sound, P, is right there in the letter's name. So it stands to reason that if kids have developed sensitivity to sound through rhyming and such, they're going to notice things, their brains are, in, in our speech stream. And they're going to be sensitive to letter names and really much more readily learn the sounds. That phonological awareness is going to give them that bridge to connect sounds to print. And that's our alphabet. Okay, next, uh, basic phoneme awareness abilities. Segmenting and blending. These facilitate decoding ability. No kidding. This is easy to understand because in order to decode a word, a beginning reader has to go one letter at a time, saying their sounds out loud to themselves, whatever. <clears throat> and then they have to blend those sounds together. So the phoneme awareness at a basic level allows them to transform individual speech sounds, phonemes, into a word. And when the beginning reader is spelling words, say, they have to segment the word they want and spell it into the phoneme. So if they're spelling mom, they have to be aware that there are three sounds in that word. Mm, ah, mm, and one by one, mm, attach that letter sound. Ah, uh, and so forth. So notice now that there should really be more arrows on this diagram. Knowing letter names and sounds the first aspect of word reading development here should have an arrow directly down to phonic decoding because that helps phonic decoding, of course, letter names and sounds. And the more time, or the more a child spends time decoding, the better they're going to get with letter names and sounds. So we could have an arrow going in that direction too. And the more time a child spends decoding, more practice they have with it, the better their basic phoneme awareness is going to become. Boop, the arrow can go that way. So despite the fact that this diagram has directions going only from phonological to word, research all over the place shows that they contribute to each other <laughs> very much so. But for our purposes here, I want to just make it clear and simple as, I, as clear and simple as I can that developing phonological awareness is crucial, absolutely necessary for word reading development. They just can't be separated. Um, there's a presentation in here on orthographic mapping that goes deeper a little bit into what it is, why it's important, and sight words and so on. But let us um, consider that in education, both how we teach and how we assess phoneme awareness, we usually say, great, this student has phoneme awareness, yay! She can segment and blend, she's all set. Let's keep going on to other things now, we're done with this. But when we do that, by doing so, we're leaving a critical, more proficient kind of phonemic awareness behind. We've made that mistake. Phonemic manipulation, and remember, please, research has shown that this doesn't develop until ages 7, 8, 9. If we keep working on phoneme awareness until students' brains can manipulate phonemes, delete, substitute, like subconsciously, like a computer on its own, a pretty cool thing's going to happen subconsciously again. As they come to words they've never seen before, their brains are going to take those phonemes and notice the order of the letters and map all of it together and notice how, um, well, it'll say something like 
and it's on self, we don't hear it, but our brains will be like, okay, I got it. T -i -m. There it is. I see the t -i -m. Oh, the M-E time. I mean, it's just going to kind of notice letter order and why the vowels are saying what they do. Fantastic stuff. Okay, so the brain needs to be wired to remember, retrieve, and think about all the sounds and words. That's how the brain needs to be wired. How are we going to get it to do this? We have to get it to build the neural connections to be aware of sounds, to process, to manipulate. And this quote goes on to say that the brain needs to be wired to form a fully specified internal image of a word. This is researcher talk for what orthographic mapping does. It lets the brain connect the sounds of the words to the specified image of words. So T, I, M, E, Tim, and me, time. The, these specific order of letters make it sound like time. If we switch those letters around to be M, I, T, E, the brain is not going to look at those and say time. No. What if we switch it to E, M, I, T, emit? Same letters, different order, different image, different pronunciation. So working with kids who have um, dyslexia and such, their brains aren't wired to remember, retrieve, and think about the sounds and words. So their brain sees four letters, T-I-M-E, and they might read a different word than time because they haven't fully gotten to that orthographic mapping piece. The, that time, that sequence of T-I-M-E doesn't elicit time, that word. All right, so they aren't accurate, and even if they become that way, it's not going to be automatic yet for them. And this is why they might be reading 30 words a minute in fourth grade. Each word is time-consuming because they don't have um, a pool of words that they can read at a glance. Working backwards, that's because they haven't gotten more advanced levels of phoneme awareness. So they might be able to set, segment and blend, maybe not even to an automatic level really, um, um, and but maybe it was considered enough because of a score they got on a test. So, all right. So here's the test I'm talking about. Here's a fluency subtest. This is from the Dibbles website. It measures basic phoneme awareness segmenting piece. It's an Dibbles is an acronym standing for D dynamic, I indicators, B basic, E early, L literacy, S skills. Phoneme awareness is a basic early literacy skill. And so by measuring how many phonemes a student can correct, oops, correctly provide us in 60 seconds, we can get a really good valid score that indicates to us if the student's phoneme awareness is on a target for a trajectory to meet a benchmark that is necessary that's correlated with later reading success. If not, what's it mean to be at risk? It, it just means they're at, their score is at risk of not meeting future benchmarks. So these subtests are giving K and first grade to see if their scores are going to hit a benchmark, a target that would signify adequate progress in this skill. And they're also used to progress monitor. I'm sure you know this. Every couple of weeks, a child may be getting an intervention such as this would be given a subtest to see if their score is steadily improving. So the word dynamic, the D in Dibbles, According to a Google dictionary search that I did, it's a means of a process or system characterized by constant change, activity, or progress. Dibbles and AmesWeb, those kind of subtests can de detect tiny bits of progress over short periods of time, two weeks, making them really sensitive and handy for educators who need to know if their instruction's really making a difference, if it's working. Um, if they're flatlining, we gotta do something different. Um, so if we have this information in front of us on a clipboard and I, I say to the student, you know, give me the sounds for this, and they respond, the score underlines each phoneme that is pronounced correctly. Um, and as soon as the student says the last phoneme, so for leaned, as soon as they say that, duh, uh, the score would give the next word, shine. And then the total number of phonemes that are underlined are counted and that raw added up number is compared to a benchmark, uh, a chart. And those norms are taken from the scores of thousands of other kids in that grade at that time of year, beginning or middle or end of year. Um, they were measured. So basic phoneme awareness, simple segmenting like this, 
blending as we have seen as we have seen they develop through kindergarten first grade saw it on the standards and generally by the time most kids reach the end of first grade they have mastered these very basic skills generally most kids if you're familiar with subtests from universal screening batteries like Dibbles and Amesweb you may have noticed that these subtests no longer get administered after first grade and that's because we expect it to be mastered by the end of first grade okay so let's review here the points made on the last few slides so you have a greater chance of getting this information into your long-term memory so the assessments that we use to measure a student's phoneme awareness um, it's typically segmenting and blending. Once a student can do that, once they can segment and blend adequately, or once they reach first grade, hmm, phoneme awareness is usually no longer measured. Despite the fact <laughs> that it is the most critically important foundation predicted piece for reading. And as we saw on uh, Reading Rockets thing, uh, phone, phone ma manipulation tasks are still developing up until fourth and fifth grade. And as Kilpatrick points out, after first grade, manipulation tasks become even more predictive of reading measures than segmentation ever did. So this has to make some sense. To manipulate phonemes actually requires a student to do more than one task. We talked about it. It's like a, a four for one. Okay, so they have to segment a word. Then they have to determine where a phoneme is in the word that we want them to delete or change. And then they have to make the change, put a new one in there. And then they have to blend the four new phonemes all together, the three old ones and the new one. <clears throat> so it's obvious why this manipulation is way more sophisticated and more of a challenge than just simple segmenting. Shine, sh I, mm, that's easy. So with segment and blend and manipulation tasks, um, it's just more sophisticated. And we want them to do that within a second or two, too. So without even thinking of it. So I don't know. I wonder why the standards don't tell us to continue making sure that students' phoneme awareness is developing after first grade. And I wonder why phoneme awareness assessments end at first grade when the research evidence shows that older students have not usually developed it and when the research shows that struggling readers have phonological awareness difficulty. So we need to keep paying attention to it. An older student is going to likely do super fine on segmentation tasks. Such an assessment is no longer able to point out who still needs help with it. They, they kind of hit a ceiling. A student will do well on it, and then we could wrongly assume that everything is fine um, with phonological awareness and let it go. All right, I have to say this again in case you missed it. It's estimated um, that as readers, we are able to read 25 to 30,000 words automatically. Um, did someone teach us how to read each and every one of those words? It's impossible. No. Once my teacher taught me how to read words like pat, lake, like, luck, I probably went on to read other words like stuck, stick, string, stringy. Uh, springy and eventually spring-loaded on my own. I taught myself the vast majorities, majority of words that I can read by coming to them in text, forming connections between the phonemes that I had in my head and those letters in that particular order, that sequence of letters. Researchers noticed that kids with letter sound knowledge and developed phoneme awareness tasks can read a never seen before word in less than a second even if it's a nonsense word. So show them the word tup, T-U-P, and they'd almost instantaneously say tup. How? In the near instant response, how did they have time to go letter by letter to sound it out? And do No, that's not how it happened. They didn't do that. So a quick segue on how that happens. How do we teach ourselves to read thousands and thousands of words, a, f a feat not all children can do? Um, set for variability in simpler words. So read this. Um, it's the ability to figure out a word by sounding one out and noticing it sounds similar to one you already know. So in Tunmer and Chapman's, Chapman's study in 2012, they pronounced words that are irregularly spelled, like the word love, and they pronounced it in a new way. They pronounced them 
using the common sounds for those letters. So they pronounce the word love like this, love. And later on, they use these newly pronounced words in sentences. I love eating cookies for breakfast. So the children who could identify the newly pronounced words were the same kids who could decode words and print more accurately. So what happens that these children is that these children are able to read along in their text and when they come to a word, okay, they sound it out. It doesn't sound exactly right, but ta -da, they realize what the word is because the context and their strong stronger vocabularies helped them. Another presentation in this series will need to address vocabulary and its impact on decoding and sight word learning, but I haven't gotten to that yet. <laughs> Stay tuned, keep checking back. Now, in my experiences, most educators, whether I'm teaching or doing PD somewhere, professional development, they will say, what are some things we can actually do? They want to know what practices, what learning tasks, what strategies, what programs. Well, now that you know, hopefully, the importance of phonological awareness, that it's non-negotiable, you'll do something, right? And now that you know that phoneme awareness is a kind of phonological awareness, you'll use appropriate strategies. You won't use one for the other, right? And when you choose which strategies and programs to use, because you have to do that, you're, you're going to need to be a savvy consumer. Publishers, textbooks, they have mistakes in them, and your knowledge of the material can go really far to help steer you from these pitfalls. So one publisher's teacher's manual, I can't name it here because I can't find the copyright information, but it's pretty funny. They featured a phoneme awareness task for a teacher to give the kids. It instructed the teacher, ask students for the phonemes in the words, whatever. The word is trip. Listen as I say each sound, chur, ip. The example kept those two consonant sounds together, chur. It didn't have the full segmentation of phonemes. So just because it's in a published program does not always mean it's correct, but it takes a really knowledgeable teacher to spot and adjust these things. On this slide, there's another example. This is from a 2015 edition of a text on interventions for reading problems. It just came out. Red underlying part. Shirt has four phonemes. Not true. It has three. Shirt. So little things like this. I like to point them out so you know that if you come to something in a program that's like, what? Head scratcher? You'll know to fix it. Okay, you have the knowledge to fix it. That's why you need the knowledge so you don't teach kids wrong. Okay, strategies. Beginning of the presentation, I recommended Road to the Code is a phonological awareness training program. You cannot get more evidence-based if you try. You can't. Highly effective, easy to use, again, 44 lessons, 15 minutes a day, quick. Um, and I hope, again, in, in here to have a whole pr presentation on it. It's requested a lot. I'll get to it. But outside of a program, the first thing, get talking to your students. Okay, so talk a lot. Build phoneme awareness or phonological awareness. To do that, it doesn't always require sitting down and stopping what you're doing and carving out a piece of your day. Tell parents all the time, when you're driving with your kids in the car seat behind you, <clears throat> turn off the radio, turn off the DVD, turn off that synced phone call, play word games, say cowboy, say cowboy. Good, now say cowboy without cow. You got it, woohoo! Say mailbox, okay, say mailbox again, but this time, don't say box and then go from compound words like that to things like kitchen. Now say kitchen, but don't say kit. Or say monster, now say monster, but don't say mon. At first it might be hard, but then they'll catch on, and you will literally be wiring their brains to process the sounds of speech. Good job, parents, good job, teachers. Eventually, you move up to phonemes. Say loon, now say loon without saying n. Mm. And of course, all the while, you'll talk about what these words mean, because we want to build vocabulary too. Um, teaching children to be aware of phonemes is not a long, time-consuming process. Great news. Play rhyming songs in the room for warm-up when they come in. When there are transition, everyone go back to your table. As you do, whisper words that rhyme with table. As you line up to go to lunch, ask children, tell me the first sound in lunch or the last sound in pizza. As you walk to lunch, if they're supposed to be quiet, as, if the rules are that they be quiet when they walk in the halls, have them hold up their fingers to show you how many sounds are in, this, in some of the words that you say quietly. A quiet game will pique their interest for sure. 
it seem like they're being naughty. At the, and the beauty of this is that you can individualize it. You can point to a child who's having difficulty and give them the word up, say, um, and then point on, to another child and give them the word skim. Does someone need to use the restroom or pencil sharpener? Of course, go ahead, but first tell me what sound pencil starts with. P yes, you got it, go sharpen that pencil. Okay, great job. All right, so talk a lot, all the time. A trustworthy source for activities, for student-centered phoneme awareness activities is awesome. The Florida Center for Reading Research here. A team of teachers down there at Florida Center, they studied the research and they developed this kind of activity to connect the research to practice for the benefit of kids' achievement, yay. So go to fcrr.org, click on student-centered activities, they're all available for free. You can download them as PDFs, make a book out of them. Objectives and materials, directions, very clear. Be leery of sites like Pinterest or Teacher Pay Teacher because often you can search for phoneme awareness and you'll get phonological awareness, like a rhyming activity. It might be great, but again, it's about being a savvy consumer and using your knowledge. As I recommended in the presentation in this series having to do with orthographic mapping, um, this manual on your presentation that you see here is a spectacular resource. It contains two things. It contains an assessment for phoneme awareness at the more sophisticated levels and quick one-minute activities to build that proficiency to the more advanced levels. So, and they really take less than a minute. There are a few easy to read and understand chapters at the beginning laying all this out and then easy to implement assessment that you can give to an entire class pretty quickly. And then the majority of the manual has those one minute activities. It's just a list of 10 word manipulations to use. It's like all done for you, you don't have to think of it. I would use them three times during the day, that's what Kilpatrick recommends, to build that phoneme manipulation ability that leads to orthographic mapping. So you can get this manual at equippedforreadingsuccess.com. All right, to wrap up, what the research has found since the 1970s about phonological awareness, which encompasses phoneme awareness, we have to include what the evidence shows in terms of preventing reading difficulty. We estimate that if, not we, but the research estimates that if schools consistently implement direct teaching of phonological awareness and letter sound knowledge, along with opportunities to apply each of these using real words, we can literally prevent reading difficulty. We have to do this when students are kindergartners and first graders, and later if necessary, but studies have shown that children who are deemed with at-risk scores due to their scores being low, um, if they got this, they were able to keep on track with their peers. Amazing. So thank you for participating in this knowledge series. Here's my contact information. If you have any questions, I'm available, and I hope you will watch others in this series. And then, of course, keep checking back, because we're going to be keep um, developing and adding more as we go along. So thank you.